Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. My dear brother and friend David Pakman of the David Pakman Show is on this show, national broadcaster and extraordinary individual. David, thank you for being on the show, how are you? My pleasure, I'm so glad to be here. All right, we're gonna chop it up about a couple of items, but let me start with what we have seen lately, this anti-Jewish rhetoric spewed by Kanye West, eaten up by individuals since, including white supremacists who are completely antithetical to the progress of anybody but white people and white supremacy. I don't want to presume what you feel about these elements. So I wanted to bring you on the show, allow you to express your sentiment and let's talk about it openly. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it's it's not surprising that such a prominent public figure repeating just about every common and typical anti-Semitic trope and stereotype is being met with a stunning amount of support. If you look at the YouTube comments on my channel when I've talked about the things that Kanye West has said, there's a shocking number of people who go, listen, David, is he's just right. You know, He's just speaking the truth. And he's finally saying the things that the very Jewish media he criticizes don't allow to be said, which is just sort of a, a, it's a repetition, it's a recycling of the very tropes themselves. So, similar to, you know, I don't really think Donald Trump created more racism or xenophobia. I think he used the language that made people that believed a lot of this stuff more comfortable admitting it publicly. I think it's a similar thing with Kanye, but I do think to some degree there are folks who are just Kanye fans. They didn't think much about Jews one way or the other who are only hearing this and saying, I don't know, maybe he is making some good points. So so he actually may be convincing some people with some of this stuff. David, you bring up a good point. And every time I've done a story where I've highlighted the coalition between Jews and civil rights leaders, where I've talked about the insanity of Kanye West and his comments and commentary, and how really people that say they're woke are identifying with white supremacy now because Kanye said it. Every time I bring that up, go to the comment section, I get the same thing. I get people saying that I'm not black anymore, or somehow I'm contrary to progress of the black community. And I, and I find it really interesting because it was Kanye West who said, that slavery was a choice. It was Kanye West who said George Floyd killed himself. It was Kanye West who wore a White Lives Matter shirt and stood next to the number one black white supremacist Candace Owens who refuses to wear a Black Lives Matter shirt. It was him that did these things in in contradiction to his own blackness and in contradiction to the community that first validated him. Let's be very clear. White America would not know who Kanye West was without black America validating him first. We did that for him. And he has lived a life contrary now, currently, um, opposite of that sentiment and that uh, approval that we gave him. So you hear this, you see what's happening. You see people are more emboldened, all right, standing on bridges, etc. Where do you think this goes? I I don't know where it goes. And the reason I say that is there is a soft anti Semitism that exists. That's kind of the term I use, where there are folks who will say, Yeah, I've heard the stereotypes, but at the end of the day, Jews are a privileged population in America. And so we don't really need to worry about it. Plus, a lot of these stereotypes are kind of positive. You know, they sound like kind of pretty good things. So there is unfortunately, I mean, listen, the hard right white supremacists, we know their view. But we have this other layer, which is this softer anti Semitism that I find problematic as well. Because a lot of folks don't know necessarily, well, a lot of those stereotypes that sound kind of okay, I'd love people to say, hey, uh, we're good at business, that sounds good. But what they don't understand are the discriminatory historical realities that led to that stereotype. The fact that it sounds positive, but what they're really saying is there is a concerted conspiratorial effort among Jews to control an industry. 
There's a lot of other stuff wrapped up in it. And a lot of people just don't understand that in, in their defense, everybody's busy living their lives, right? It's not, they're not necessarily bad people because they don't know this stuff. But it can, the soft anti Semitism can be very recalcitrant. You know, it was Dr. King who said we should judge people based on the content of their character. Uh, there are individuals I am allied with because of their individual values. Um, I understand that there are uh, individuals inside of that group that may be completely contrary to my values. That goes for every demographic, including the Jewish demographic. There are those who are absolutely for me, there are those who may not be. But we even find that in uh, the movement for black lives. Uh, we found that during the time of Dr. King. Uh, my college students were shocked when I told them less than 10% of churches would even allow Dr. King to speak at their churches. Only 6% of America was actually in support of Dr. King based on a survey done by NBC when he was living. So the curated Dr. King we have today, the more digestible Dr. King we have today was not a digestible individual back then according to the sentiment of the majority of Americans and even the majority of preachers who would not allow him, black preachers in particular, who would not allow him to step foot in their church. But that doesn't mean that I'm now anti black people or anti black church or anti this or anti that. I'm still connecting with people based on values and based on the content of their character. How do you think we lost this, David, at some point? You know, I, I don't know. And again, like you say, every demographic group in the United States has examples of everything. And one of the things that I am sort of very disappointed by and upset by is what was historically a really important alliance between Jewish folks and black folks in the United States that has to a little bit of a degree been ruptured because of some anti-Semitism within the black community. And I told the story on my show, if you know, the, the famous Mississippi burning story yep. where three people were killed. Two of the three people were Jewish folks from New York City who understood the goals here are so similar between our groups of people. The historical circumstances have similarities, although they are not by any means the same. There are important value similarities where we should be allied here rather than butting heads. And it's it's disappointing to see that in certain enclaves that has completely broken down. You know, I finished doctoral studies at Clark Atlanta University. Clark Atlanta University has a connection to W.E.B. Du Bois. And we've always considered him to be one of our strong black scholars. Obviously, he was a black intellectual, but he also understood the necessity of black progress in America. And so he created coalitions with Jewish Americans. And those coalitions were very strong, including the NAACP, which was a Jewish black coalition initially in the foundation of it. But he also received criticism from people like Marcus Garvey. He received criticism from others who were for progress, but did not like his ideology. But I do find it quite interesting that today we can actually study both ideologies, both of these men as individuals, as well as leaders of a particular movement and appreciate what they brought to the table while understanding we may not agree with every element they subscribe to. The nuance, that nuance doesn't exist in this era as it did back then or in the context of history, do you agree? I completely agree. And the the other part of this that I think is important, and this is particularly relevant in the era of MAGA, and this is not exactly what you're talking about, but it's another layer. There's a reflexive instinct by some to say, this isn't this whole Kanye thing, it's not about anti-Semitism, it's about mental illness. He says he's not taking the pills that a Jewish doctor told him to take. This is mental illness, plain and simple. And it's really important not to see these things as either or or one or the other. There's lots of mental illness and mentally ill individuals who have good or bad ideas, who have inclusive or discriminatory ideas. And also there is anti-Semitism and other types of racism and xenophobia that has nothing to do with mental illness or it might overlap with it. And one of the other concerns when you talk about seeing seeing people as individuals and evaluating the things they say, You don't have to ignore the content of what they say because there may be a mental illness component. And that's another thing that is unfortunately being used by some to sort of not necessarily excuse, but diminish the importance of the content of what Kanye has been saying. You know, we have to take things based on its impact. That's literally how we respond as a societal construct. This has great impact. 
Freedom of speech, let's talk about that before we have to end this interview. Uh, freedom of speech is not freedom of consequence or freedom from consequence. Uh, somehow, somehow, either Kanye or the people who support Kanye, and it is bigger than Kanye, I'm just using him as a, utilizing this as a microcosm. Why would Kanye escape the cause and effect relationship of freedom of speech? Yes, but it does not mean freedom from consequence. We all have that dynamic connected to us. Anything we offer for the public will either be criticized or it will be supported. That's how this works. What are your thoughts about this sentiment now? A lot of it is pushed from the conservatives that suggest and some flat out say freedom of speech should mean freedom from consequence. Yeah, I mean, that's not new. That's that's an old trope, which is they most loudly talk about freedom of speech, but they want there to be no consequences to them using that freedom of speech, with they, which they claim someone else, I guess the left or Democrats are trying to, to take away from them. There are absolutely consequences to speech, assuming that they are not a violation of one's First Amendment rights, valid, should be expected, part of the discourse and the dialogue that exists. One of the really unfortunate things that's happening with the Kanye situation is the fact that his outrageous speech is having consequences, is being used to say, look, he's right. He said this stuff and now the very Jewish media he attacked is silencing him. And one and that's, that can be very difficult to escape the bubble of and it's very damaging that that's taking place. Earlier today, I saw this on social media, Tucker Carlson flat out saying that hate speech does not actually exist. Now remember, he's an ally now of Kanye West. Kanye West, I think is more strategic than most people give him credit for because he goes out of his out of his way, David, to not offend racist white people. What are your thoughts yes. on that? Uh, 100% and the, it, I, I don't know whether these are ideas that we've heard over the last three weeks from Kanye that he stumbled upon himself or whether people have been suggesting or giving him some of this material. But the material is aligning absolutely perfectly with what a lot of those racist folks already believe. And much like with Trump, they heard a little kernel of something that sounded pretty good. They're hearing it from Kanye right now. David, always a pleasure. Dear brother, talking to you, I appreciate what you continue to do in your advocacy and your platforms. For those who may be living under a rock and they don't know how to check out your shows, please tell them how they can do so. Yeah, just my website's the the, the central place, davidpackman.com. Thank you, my friend, until next time. Thank you.